ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to have you here. Such a colorful, interesting group of people from all over the world. From working on very different topics in different disciplines, um, in NGOs, in research, doing their PhD, doing their postdocs, doing their uh, professorships, etc. But working on very similar topics in even similar regions of the world. So, here we have a lot of experts working on particular fields. We also have two experts who've been working on particular fields for a very, very long time and very, very big success. So, we have two successful uh, stories today here to, um, among us. One is the success story of uh, Dr. Sabrula Chodri from Bangladesh. He got the so-called alternative Nobel Prize for his uh, long-time work on health for the poor, health, improving the health situation of the poor in Bangladesh. And I think there are many uh, stories we can uh, hear from him where we can learn from for our own work, be it academically or practically. The second success story is the story of Professor Anwar Faza, who is with us here. So he's been working for the last 30 years on nearly one dozen different initiatives to increase the power of the consumers and the power of the consumer rights in different uh, areas of the world on different topics regionally, nationally, as well as internationally and globally. So we are happy to have these two alternative Nobel Prize uh, winners here. And uh, tomorrow morning for the workshop, also another alternative Nobel Prize winner, uh, Nimo Vesli from Nigeria, will join us. So for our uh, small opening here at the Center for Development Research, um, we are happy to have uh, four hours for people, representatives from four different organizations who are related, strongly related, uh, with the uh, Right Life Year College here in Bonn. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Conrad Schetta, who is the acting director of the Center for Development Research. This is uh, Dr. Helmut Blumbach, who is the head of the program division south of the German Academic uh, Exchange Service. I already mentioned Professor Anwar Fazal, who is also a professor at the University of Science Malaysia in Finland. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Sharan Srinivas, uh, who is the program and research manager of the Right Life Award. He came to us from Stockholm today. So, Warm regards, and maybe we can start with an uh, introduction and a welcome from Dr. Shekhar. Yeah, good morning everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you and to uh, give you some welcome remarks. First, I have to mention that I shouldn't stay here because uh, the idea was that uh, this uh, welcome uh, should be given by our director, uh, Sol Weigerke. Unfortunately, her flight was cancelled and she couldn't come and make it here, so I only learned in the morning that I should uh, give this welcome address. So this is uh, the negative uh, message I have to convey, but there's also a positive one that I can include, um, because as I learned from the program, I should not talk for the next 20 minutes. Due to I talk double the fast than our director, I can do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, so I don't have to talk for such a long time. Uh, and uh, first of all, of course, I'm very happy that you are all with us. I very much like uh, to welcome our distinguished guests. We are very happy that you are here. I'm very happy that uh, Safola Chaudo he is here. I think he's, he received his, uh, uh, his uh, alternative Nobel Prize for a very important issue, the issue of uh, improving the public health, but in particular, uh, because of the expensive of uh, uh, medicals uh, and, and drugs, I think this is a very important issue in many countries of the world. And I know in particular because my wife, she's a doctor, and she's always 
blaming the pharmacy for the, uh, for the uh, expensive drugs and medicines. I'm also very happy that we got uh, Mr. Anwar Fazal with us. I think I don't have to tell more about I think Till may talk a lot about you. I think you're one of the, the old boys of the, uh, of the Right Livelihood uh, Award. I think you received your award already in 1982. So uh, one who was really from the beginning part of this whole very fascinating uh, idea. I also want to mention that uh, Nemo Basi will only join us tomorrow. I think uh, it's also, also a very interesting uh, person because uh, he uh, in particular uh, was uh, um, uh, active in the fight against the impact of the oil, oil exploitation, as you might know, which is a huge story in Nigeria and the Nigeria Delta. And here he was very much uh, doing research against the oil exploration uh, of the ecological environment as well as of the livelihood of the people. Of course, we are very happy that uh, Sharon Srinivas uh, is uh, with us. And of course, we are very happy that also Helmut Blumba is here with us today because I think he's our main funder, the main funder of this whole uh, Right Livelihood uh, College. So we're very happy that uh, you are here with us, you're the head of the program division south of the German Academic Exchange Service, we call you the DARD, but I just learned by Anwar that it's also called DART in uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Asia. Um, I will not now stop to give you a long talk about introduction about what ZEF is doing. If you've got an interest, we got a very nice movie on what ZEF is doing on our homepage. I just would like to link in the next five minutes what ZEF is doing and why it might be there are some, um, some linkages to the right life of what uh, college. Just to tell you, uh, like to tell you that the Center for Development Research is a center of the University of Bonn. So we are part of the University of Bonn and we came into being in the mid 1990s. It was a time when the German government decided to move the, the capital from Bonn to Berlin. And that time the uh, question came up, what should happen with poor Bonn, with this poor city? And then the idea came up, okay, Bonn should become the place for development, for development research uh, in Germany. And this is the reason why we find today more than 80 development agencies in and around Bonn, and why University of Bonn uh, took up the idea of, uh, of uh, having a center of development research. And this is the reason why we are here. We are still, I think, a quite young uh, institute, uh, but I think also we are growing older day by day. Interesting with that is that we are a very interdisciplinary uh, institute. This means that you find a wide range of uh, researchers in our institute, starting from social anthropologists and ending uh, with, some, uh, with some economists or with some biologists. So we try to integrate uh, researchers from the background of natural science research, from economics, but also from social and uh, political science. Moreover, our idea is also to bridge the gap between, on the one side, fundamental research, what we are doing, on the other side, applied research. And this is, as you can, uh, might know from your own PhD, it's, uh, um, it's uh, every day we have to, to fight with, this, with, uh, with bridging this gap because it's a very difficult issue, particularly when you uh, think about that you don't want to uh, be in a nutshell or in an ivory tower, sitting in the ivory tower and just doing your research, but our aim is always also to transfer our ideas uh, into the public, uh, to talk to policymakers, to people who can really uh, use our uh, research findings. This is something we strongly try here uh, at ZEF. I like to um, set up three issues where I see strong links between the Right Livelihood College and what our institute uh, is doing. The first one is, of course, uh, that, we are very, that we are so happy that we got the campus uh, here at ZEF, is that there are already many relationships between our campus and some other ones. As you might know, there's one campus in, uh, in Sweden, in Lund University, the Center for Sustainable, uh, Sustainability Studies. The second one is the one, of course, of the University uh, Science Malaysia and our director Salva Gerke, she's here strongly collaborating uh, with the second uh, campus. 
And the third one is the one in Addis Ababa, at, at Addis Ababa University, and Till Stellmacher, he is very strongly collaborating with them. And we had, since the last 10 years, very fruitful corporations and projects in, 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 in Ethiopia, and we are always collaborating very strongly. This is third campus. So we are the last, the, the newest one, the fourth campus, and we hope also in the future to collaborate very strongly with the three other ones. The second one uh, is perhaps uh, more interesting, in particular for the students who are here. Uh, so what uh, might be important is that the Center for Development Research aims uh, or get a strong emphasis on uh, capacity building. So one of our main tasks is to build uh, capacities, and not only here in Bonn, uh, but uh, worldwide. Uh, so currently we've got different programs in summer schools, which we are carrying out, for example, in Agra in Ghana, in Addis Abeba, or since recently, for example, in Lahore uh, in Pakistan. Second, the second, or second um, uh, uh, footprint is that we got here a doctoral international interdisciplinary doctoral student program. Every year we have here uh, between 30, uh, from 30 up to 50 new students coming here in, uh, in doing their PhD here at the University of Bonn. And here we also like to uh, combine our uh, international program with the RLC campus by having every year uh, one uh, PhD candidate uh, which is funded by the DAD uh, for the Right Livelihood uh, Campus. This year we had, or since last year we have here, for example, Wang Teng Lai uh, from Malaysia, who is the first uh, RC on PhD student. And she unfortunately cannot be with us today because she just started uh, one month ago uh, a field research on migrant workers in Penang State. I think it's a very important Topic, and I think particular also if we talk about social mobilization, as we intend to do this in this workshop, I think this is a very a topic with a, with a tremendous uh, importance. So that we hope that with this, all this workshop that we can provide a certain expertise in uh, training in capacity building here for the RLC campus, in particular for the current workshop. With other words, it also means that in the next days you will meet many of my colleagues who are working on topics which are very strongly related to social movements, uh, to social mobility, and you will have a lot of chances uh, to discuss with them uh, your topics. The third link, and I think this is the most important one, is the topic content. Um, and I think here we have always to remind ourselves why we got the Right Livelihood Award. And I think it's What's the striking thing with the livelihood uh, award is that it always, uh, that it always is, is on search for alternative paths of thinking and of acting. Uh, the right livelihood philosophy is to break out of the conventional accepted cycles and ways of thinking. I think that's important. Always looking for alternatives in thinking. And I think this is often coming uh, too short in the academia also trying to take an alternative stance of understanding the world, finding uh, and, uh, of creative uh, innovations, all things, I think, uh, makes up the right life. You want to make it such a, such a tremendous uh, award worldwide. In this, I'm happy, uh, in this respect, I'm very happy that that was identified to pro provide a right life to campus. So we, as that, we hope to learn a lot from the laureates, uh, but also of the students, in ways of an alternative thinking. I think that's important, in this learning of alternative uh, thinking. And uh, I hope that this might be an appropriate uh, place, uh, appropriate, appropriate location for this um, exercise. The reason why I think that this might be a good place for doing this is that uh, this is... Uh, focusing on this inter-, inter or even transdisciplinarity. This means that we always start uh, with a problem. We don't start with a discipline. We are always very strongly driven by a problem. We see a problem in the world and hope to improve this problem. And then all these disciplinary boundaries doesn't matter. And I think this is a uh, unique uh, case. We hardly find many other institutes worldwide which have really tried to follow in this approach and always come back and ask ourselves, what is next? discipline boundary we have to break to solve a question. I think this is something which always comes to our mind, 
which is often very hard, I have to uh, admit, which is all, always often very lot of work. And people who start to work here with as it says, coming from a discipline need a long time to start to think another way, alternative way. And I think in this thinking of alternative ways lies perhaps um, um, uh, kind of a silent cooperation between the right life you are about and uh, what we are doing here. What I think is um, here also um, interesting is that we at ZEF try to shift the perspective. So we usually are not focusing on general policies, on um, general of the, the large terms. So we don't start with international organizations, with the World Bank, the United Nations. No, we start with the local. We usually start with the local, with the farmer, with the fishermen. In our projects, we are carrying out in Vietnam, in Ghana, in Ethiopia, Uzbekistan, and elsewhere. For it's important always to start with the single persons or with the, with the community, communities and to understand their livelihood strategies. And I think this makes a tremendous uh, difference because hereby we often learn about the dividing gap between on the one side the interpretation of life uh, by global organizations and on the other side uh, of local actors. And I think by focusing on the local actors we learn more, a lot about how we can perceive the world in another way. Um, I'd just like to give you one example before I uh, close my speech. Um, in development policies, we very uh, often observe uh, that there's a fashion to believe in good governance. I think this is a topic uh, which you can uh, hear and read everywhere. Um, but in the end, uh, it does not mean something different than um, the introduction of the political rules and structures uh, which are working in the West. Uh, to boil it down in a very, um, um, uh, in a very, um, in a nutshell. Um, hereby, we often uh, do not see that also, also local formations of governance exist. And I think this we have always to learn, also to see alternative way of how people uh, uh, strike the living. And just to give one example uh, of my research uh, I did in Afghanistan, and you can say. Um, here, development agencies, when they entered after 2001 Afghanistan, they believed that they enter a war-ridden country in which you can't find one stone on the other, a country where really to start with everything from the scratch. And we did at that time, uh, five years ago, a, a research project uh, in, on local politics in northern Afghanistan. And we, uh, uh, there was one um, development project we had a strong interest in. It was a project on large irrigation, a project funded by the European Union. And there was a wonderful idea uh, to build up this uh, large irrigation. Uh, we have to build up water user associations. This was more or less the whole day, the idea of modern forms of governance and, and participation. But the whole project, which for was a thing about, about uh, 50 or 80 million euro, neglected completely that there were local structures, which somehow worked. And what was striking when I was in that region in the year 2006, uh, there was, was a flood and one dam was broken. And in the very next two weeks, uh, this whole European Union project was not able to mobilize uh, the Water User Association to rebuild the dam. And there was also no need to do it because the traditional, uh, for, uh, the traditional uh, groups, the traditional community, com communities did this within 24 hours. So what you could learn about is on the one side there was a much funds spent to build up uh, something new, completely neglecting working structures uh, which were there. And here I, I think I also like more or less to uh, come back to the, with this example, uh, with the title of this workshop we have here uh, this week, Mobilize, Mobilization for Change, Social Movements in a Developing World. I think this is a very tremendous um, issue which was chosen for this year's uh, workshop. And I think we have also think about, if we talk about social movements, that social movements are often seen as something, as something dangerous, I would say. That it's somehow irritating the way how policy is made. It's something new. Policy makers often don't know how they should cope with it. But the last case was in Germany when the uh, Piraten, the party of the pirates, uh, came into being and uh, took a lot of seats in, uh, in uh, German federal parliaments. And uh, these are 
sex with uh, somehow irritating people. So social movements, from where they're, where they're coming, we got to say, why we need social movements. This is something which often comes up from where this power by the people is coming. Um, more or less, it's something, the social, social movements are the ones who are formulating alternatives to ongoing processes and the ones who really want to have a change. This means not only in regard to the outcome, but perhaps also in regard to the process. They are the ones who are really uh, want to have a, um, a change. In my space, so I hope that one outcome of this workshop is a discussion about how to improve uh, the political space, also the social space, for this kind of movement, and how uh, to provide them a stronger political acceptance. On the other side, there's always the peril, the danger, to see them only as a cheap substitute for deficient government structures. I think there's also a peril within these movements that they just become institutionalized and become them that what uh, they never wanted to be. Um, if you just scroll through the program, I'm sure you all have the chance to scroll through the, through the program, you will see that in the next uh, week we will discuss many different kinds of social movements, also from different angles. Uh, I was really fascinated by all the case studies uh, which were brought up by the uh, PhD students. Uh, I think in the next week we will discuss on farmers, we will discuss on cooperatives, on social networks, street children, but also on political elites, religious movements, uh, or journalists, minorities uh, or journalists. So uh, many, I think we got many different types of social uh, movements uh, we will discuss. Um, I wish you all a very successful, or us all, a very successful um, uh, conference here. Um, I think uh, uh, that uh, there might, that we got, that, that as well as the RC campus got uh, in mind, to look for alternative ways, also perhaps to break out of our own thinking and saying, okay, not the other one has right, or there's some, something new, interesting inside. So be open for something new. I think that's important. My many thanks goes again to the laureates, as well to the DAD and Helmut Blumbach, and of course to Tim Stellmacher, who organized everything. I think we should have thought so. Next to my one, I think I, call, I, I, I came off in this office during the last days from the, at midnight or the morning. He right? was always in the office. So <laughs> I think it's become in the last two weeks or the last month his uh, second home for sure. And yeah, thank you very much. And I'd like to hand over the floor to Tim. Thank you, Thank you very, very much, much uh, um, for, for this uh, first talk. I think there were two issues which were particularly important. One was the problem orientation of the work, which we are doing here at SEF since uh, almost one and a half decades. The alternative Nobel Prize winners, of course, do this problem orientations. They started with one problem and they didn't start with you know, one discipline and thinking about the discipline or studying the discipline first. And, uh, you, as PhD students, you work on problem problems. And we have a high diversity of uh, different disciplinary backgrounds here, from anthropologists uh, to economists uh, to political scientists up to biologists, here in one room. You know, this is what we find very exciting, and this is also how set functions. The second issue, what I found particularly interesting, is that we can learn from you from your expertise in your particular fields uh, in your countries on the ground. So, and research has to be open. Research, uh, you cannot sit in this ivory tower here. You know, we uh, can learn from you and also to see which new and highly relevant researching, research topics are coming up. Not only next year, but in the coming decades. Thank you, by saying this, I would like to ask uh, Professor Dr. Amra Fazal from Malaysia to give his opening speech. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. Very good afternoon. You couldn't have chosen a better setting. You're sitting up there to see this forest uh, out mm -hmm. there and the number of birds that actually came in to find out what we were doing. <laughs> you know, they came and they listened and they moved around and I think they're passing the word around and said there's something 
unusual happening in this room and they can feel the energy of so many continents of the world because birds very often are intercontinental you know, and they are not respecting the kind of boundaries that sometimes uh, other people have. Uh, I have a setting like this also in uh, Malaysia because the campus uh, uh, of the University of Science uh, Malaysia uh, is also uh, designed in such a way that it's supposed to be a university in a garden. And that's the, the, the philosophy. And uh, the university also happens to be in an area, the address, called Minden, which is unusual because Minden is in Germany. <laughs> Yes, it's in Germany, so that whole campus address, University of Science Malaysia, Minden, Malaysia. And very often people say, you're going to confuse the post office, you know, <laughs> DHL and, uh, you know, which, which is all over the world, of course, you know. Uh, but it shows you sometimes very interesting links. Can you imagine a story where 300 years ago, the British and the Germans were together as one force fighting, I think, the Dutch and the French. You know, whatever it was called, the Hundred Years' War, a Thousand Years' War, you know. Uh, and a battle was fought in the town of Minden in Germany. And in that battle, Germany and England, the joint forces, defeated the enemy. Whoever was the enemy, I can't remember. You know, but I probably, you probably know in terms of history. And they won. And because they won, this particular British regiment that worked together with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Germany always began to be known as the Minden Regiment because they won that war in Germany. And they were so proud. Maybe it was the only war they ever won. <laughs> they were proud. And uh, sometime in history, it was about, I think, uh, 60, 70 years ago, that regiment was posted to Malaysia because we were a colony, and they occupied these barracks, and they decided to change the name of the barracks to Minden, the Minden <laughs> barracks. So it's interesting how global events uh, suddenly end up taking new kinds of occupying situations, and the bulk of the people in Penang, bulk of the international people, don't really know this stream of history that actually occurred. And yet it is so important because connectivity now is a very complex thing and you will be amazed to find how connected sometimes you are. <laughs> Suddenly, in fact, we examine, some of us may find that we're actually cousins. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are all cousins to our friend from Ethiopia, of course, you know, <laughs> but even more closer in... Uh, but that is the new kind of world opening, which over many years, because of national boundaries, we had de, you know, sort of prison, in prison, we had imprisoned people all over the place when we were actually beautiful waves of interconnectivity over history, depending on nature and many other things, but we, we changed. And now what has happened is that there is another big move towards interconnectivity. And this interconnectivity now through internet, web, spy, Skype, I mean, you, you, you transcend all the kinds of barriers that were there before. And this particular program that we are engaged in is also one of those transcending, transcending programs. A program that trans, it transcends disciplines, it transcends geography, it transcends also the big issue between what is you know, the worry of the optimists and the worry of the pessimists, you know, the kind of people who will spend long times arguing whether this glass is half full or half empty. You know? and, uh, so these transcending kinds of uh, challenges now are the challenges of the future. And what is wonderful is that Zeph is one of the transcenders globally, and one of the best transcenders globally, if you look at the history of the research and his work and the scholars that it begins. And da, I must learn to call D.I. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> because in Malaysia, when we say 
DID. Uh, it's the drainage and irrigation department. <laughs> so I find it a bit difficult to. Uh, it hasn't got a particularly good record. Uh, <laughs> Because when you want things drained, uh, you know, they don't do it very well, you know. When you want things irrigated, uh, they don't either, yeah. It's, uh, that, that, that is fine. <laughs> and it's also closer to that, you know, in a way they are like the mother and the father of many great things. And one of the wonderful things that they do in that transcending work is that you don't just bring people uh, from one place and, you know, they are homogeneous. You're actually creating a global community, and this is a kind of United Nations, but a kind of United Nations that's centered on problems and reducing the distance between problem and solution, because the actions are in your, in your hands. Huh? It's, it's there, you are close to doing the research, and you want to see the outcome making a difference. Huh? And that's a wonderful kind of situation, and, and we're so grateful to that for making this kind of transcending, because the global community we need now, you can say the future community that we need now, are the people who are transcenders. Because the world has moved towards separation of different kinds of identities. Because if you look at the problems, we breathe one from one air, we rise from one ocean, we drink from one water, and at the same time, children cry the same all over the world. You know, Laughter. People laugh. You can't distinguish an uh, Ethiopian laugh from, uh, you know, a Malaysian laugh or, you know, laughter. Although maybe it's the subject for some study to see whether you can identify, you know, this laugh is from, these are the English, you know, I mean, they laugh like that. Maybe some close their mouth and laugh and some open their mouth, you know, but it's uh, interesting. We all laugh. Our blood is all red. And the songs that we play with our heart, I mean, you know, they all play the same kind of song. So there's a certain, uh, not only really just transcending, there's a certain universality uh, that we also have to deal with. Huh? And this uh, universality uh, is something that uh, we have to generate. Because the problems themselves have this universality. And this universality, universality may operate in different places in a local, local way. But we need... The groups that will make success in one place, and then our hope is that it will proliferate, it will uh, go viral, uh, as they like to say in computers, uh, that other people can be inspired by, by actions. But to do this, uh, of course, we need people who think about the future. I'm so happy that uh, together with all of us, uh, there's a, a group called The Future present here. That's the Youth for the Future. These two young men, they were young people, young people. Uh, they were part of the last conference that we held, the 30th anniversary, because we decided that we didn't want the conference of just the laureates talking to the laureates. Because our average age is increasing, you know. Uh, <laughs> mathematically, if we do the mathematics, you know, we're getting older and older and older. You know? uh, that's the nature of these kinds of awards. Huh? There's a certain mathematics about uh, uh, movements. And so you need to engage immediately in new generations. And we talk normally of the three generations. I said any social movement, any social movement that wants to continue to be a movement, that means it must move, must always engage three generations. This is the three G, you know, which everybody knows in uh, the phones. But social movements, remember, if you want to make great success, how you, do you draw from the wisdom, the tears, and sufferings of the older generation? Because they can give you something. Right? They can give you both wisdom and they can give you tears and suffering of what uh, happened. And you need also the generation below who need to move on and carry on the struggle. And the more you engage them while these things are going on in an interactive way, the more likely the movement is actually going to be a strong, constant uh, energy. Most places they fail, the old are disconnected, the young are ignored because they are, you know, we've got no time for them because we've got so much work to do, you know, and of course any organization that 
thinks in that kind of way, I say that they are not a movement anymore. They're just going to be something that's going to fizzle off uh, very soon. So these programs, when we did, we said we are going to have a parallel youth conference. In fact, our idea, Sharon and I was even much bolder when we started. We said, hey, tell every laureate, we're going to pay for you to come here, provided you bring at least two young people together with you. <laughs> then your team will be three. Yeah? And you will come for the conference and you'll bring two young persons who are like uh, the interns and, and so And they will be the future. They will come here, not only do they relate to you, they will relate to wonderful other laureates, plus they will relate also to other young people all over the world, and you build again the transcenders, you build again that kind of universality, universality that you need for dealing with the, with the future. So they said, well, it's too complicated, you know, the, you know, I mean, some, this is a joke a little bit, I mean, we already got baggage to carry, and then we have to carry these two young people also, you know, you know how people talk sometimes, you know, too much baggage, you know, uh, so we said, never mind, okay. We will do two things. One, we will encourage, and we were we had this wonderful arrangement of the Youth for the Future group. All very young people organizing a parallel conference, drawing on the laureates, and a group of them always attending our conference. And then we decided also that all the conference reporting will be done by postgraduate students. So that we begin also the kind of link that is being made here in uh, ZEF with postgraduate. We said, look around. Advertise, use the ZEF network uh, in place. Would you like to come and spend one week with 100 over or around 100 amazing people from all over the world? You will stay with them, but you have to be repertoires. You work, but you have total access. And so that was again an amazing way of linking up the three generations of uh, our work. And, and it was amazing if you look at all the young people who were there, you know, they were, wow, you know, because usually they are asked to come and man the registration desk or, you know, do uh, what would be manual work, but not the engaging work. Huh? They become cheap, voluntary labor. Yeah? And, uh, so that engaged us in a different kind of way. So those are the kind of uh, spirit the kind of transcending spirit, the universality spirit, the three generation uh, spirit. Because if you have that, then you really have social movements that move ahead. And social movements that will move ahead that also will transcend institutions. You can see how different universities from different parts of the world are linking up together and they see so many connectivities. We find different governments engaging uh, with us. And through this, we have this wonderful phenomenon or, or the wonderful platform of change persons and academics making closer links together and reducing the distance between research and te uh, teaching and action yeah? because we want to see things moving at a much, much faster stage. When I was looking at the birds also, I was reminded of probably the first major work in modern times on good governance. It was called the Conference of the Birds. How many of you have ever heard of a book called the Conference of the Birds? What person is rough? Trying to put up the hand, not sure. I heard of it, but I not say more. Do you know the author? Atar, A-T-T-R, Atar. Now, he was a Sufi writer in uh, Persia, a remarkable person. And what problems did they have at that time? You had a, a, a governance system that was usually um, uh, a powerful leader uh, who was a dynasty. Now, for you to challenge those kinds of people, if they're doing wrong, it's not easy because you will get... Your head will be separated, will be living in a different place from the rest of your body, let's say, you know. Uh, or, uh, you know, you will be asked to go and live somewhere else. All kinds of things will happen. But this remarkable author, uh, writer, his book is one of the Penguin classics. If you take the books, classic books of the world, and if you were doing 
uh, 300 or 500 classic books of the world of the last 500 years, this book will be there. But yet it's sort of like forgotten. And what happened was that he wanted to give some important messages to the people who run the civilization or their empires and so on. So what he did was to get a story where the king has died or the emperor has died. And birds from all over the world come for this conference to discuss to discuss what kind of values and virtues and skills should the new emperor have. So it was an unusual, and he couldn't make a statement say, hey, let's have this because then say you are biased, you're trying to promote this person there. But to put it into a play, yeah, to put in the story, that each bird. As the journey continues, tells the story of how they had experience with a person, they selected this person on this basis, and the person turned out to be like this. So, the parables of uh, all the different kinds of birds, and each bird is different, eh? and uh, each tells their story, and the whole thing leads up to an amazing story of all the kinds of issues that we have to worry about when we talk about leadership, when we talk about virtues, we talk about skills, we talk about the kind of leadership that we want. So, if any of you has not read that book uh, yet, try and look for it. It's not going to be easy, easy reading because it very often is made into an opera, you know, and the people sing the opera, you know, uh, you know, you go up and down your body, but you know, you don't know exactly what sometimes is uh, said. There's a British uh, version, which is the opera version. There are simple versions. There are now also uh, children's versions that they are trying to, they're trying to simplify this because it's a powerful way of mobilizing thought yeah? and the total way and, and using again the birds yeah? and the universality of these birds and yet the difference of the birds because the pigeon has a different story from the peacock with a different story from uh, uh, the flamingo or you know it's, it's just amazing the, the diversity itself so this kind of social mobilization uh, efforts even come from literary people in unusual kinds of ways. So our challenge, our challenge, I think covers three maybe areas. And I will tell a story for each one of them. The first one is somebody, you go up and the person is laying bricks. And the person is laying bricks. And you ask the person, what are you doing? The person says, I, I'm laying brick. There's another person laying there, and you ask him, what are you doing? He says, I am building a school. I am building a school. They're doing exactly the same thing. But the first one says, I'm laying a brick. The other person says, I'm building a school. And you go to a third person, says, what are you doing? He said, you know, I want to make a better world. That's why I'm here. Uh, helping out in this particular enterprise, you know. So his vision is not just a brick only of the school, but he has come because he wants to see some transformation. And this building and the laying of the brick is a symbol of something big that he wants to achieve in the future. So he may be from the German volunteer service helping this particular country to put something on because for him it's not just a brick in the school, but to have a better world uh, out there. So, this visioning idea, you can be trapped or necessarily, you, you, there will be different kinds of levels of thinking and you have to understand these three uh, levels and, and academics can suffer from the same, or you can say, they have to go through, you know, uh, similar kinds of, which some of them are like the bricklayer, yeah? some of them are the, like the school builder and some of them are the earth builder. In, uh, in the place and that vision very often also colors their, the way that they operate and, uh, 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 and, and move forward. The second story is you find, you've heard of uh, Sherlock Holmes yes. and Dr. Watson, yes. anybody not heard of them? They, they are detectives, you know, very famous detectives in history, the most, most famous, I think, uh, maybe they didn't even exist, but you know, it's amazing how non-existing things can become very famous here yeah? uh, and very popular. They went camping 
one time. And in the camping, uh, they were tracking, looking at things, and finally they had a, they decided to stay in one place in a nice little forest. They built a, a little tent and they slept inside the tent. In the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes woke up Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson, wake up, wake up, and Dr. Watson, wake up. And he said, look up. Do you see what happened? He looks up, he says, ah, I think I see a shooting star. And the moon, it's a full moon today, you know, and, and I think I see a vaguely the galaxy up there. And Sherlock Holmes tells him, you stupid man, somebody has stolen our tent. <laughs> so sometimes we get trapped in, in, you know, sometimes looking very far away and unable to see the very dangerous or, you know, media situation that is even very close. Yeah. And that is another kind of trap sometimes, yeah? Well, we need, we need people who are visionaries, but a visionary at a time when, in fact, you have a different kind of crisis, uh, you know, therefore has to be carefully uh, evaluated in, in that. So that story about, uh, uh, about this tells you that we need sometimes the sense of immediacy. And that some things are urgent, some things need to be attention. These are what you call the problem-centered uh, approaches. Yeah. And at that time, you can be a dreamer, but they said you want to realize your dreams, the first thing to do is to wake up. Yeah, well, That's the expression we always uh, use. Yeah. You are asking me to, <laughs> to wrap up, to wrap up uh, in the place. Yes. So, the third story and the last story. Okay. This is... There's a particular town where they find, oh God, they're always finding babies in the river drowning. So they're always going there, saving the babies, and they're so happy that they have saved the babies. And they're so busy saving the babies that they never think, why are all these babies appearing in the river? I mean, they could be babies of different you know, human or other kinds of babies. When what they should be thinking about instead of being proud and say we have saved the baby, is looking up in the river, say, who is throwing the babies into the river? And actually doing something about the throwing of those in the river. And that means we have to also think structure. Sometimes some problems are symptomatic, and some problems require structural thinking. And so when you're doing your work, you need... So, for us in the Right Livelihood College, we do bring all these kinds of concepts through the lives of 150 people from some 60 countries. They bring these kinds of wisdom, these kinds of experience, and we want to link them more and more with universities. But the universities are a medium. The main group that we want to reach together with the universities, because we share one constituency in the three generations. That's the next generation, the people who are going to decide the future. And so our partnership, our partnership is largely aimed at the young people in the future. And that's why we have this particular program, and that's why we are looking forward to working with you very much and enlarging the community of people like you so that we can see very soon a better world a more peaceful world, a more just world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Anwar Basal. So um, there are two things that I found particularly you know, was, uh, interesting and striking. One uh, was that, I mean, the laureates uh, got the, the award for dedicating their lifetime to one idea which successfully worked out in practice. So they dedicated their lifetime. This means that they are normally, not always, a little bit more senior in age. Students are normally at the beginning of their uh, careers. Not always, but so, so you know, you, uh, more general they are. Uh, so even in this room, so we can find 
different generations. And I think this intergenerational exchange, uh, problem specific, problem oriented, this is quite important. And I think also this platform of the RNC offer this, as you can see here in the room. Second thing what I uh, found very uh, important is, of course, this internationality. And you mentioned, uh, Anwar, the, the connections, the German uh, Malayan connections 300 years ago. Yeah? And nowadays, I mean, connections, of course, are uh, many more. You, uh, you, you know about all these globalization issues. But the academic exchange, uh, of course, is more important than ever. And it's interesting to, to see the scholars of the, of the, the, the great Greek scholars of uh, 3,000 years ago, or the Roman scholars, already they did a kind of uh, you know, international academic exchange at these times. So this is quite important. And of course, nowadays it's on larger scales and, and globally. But I mean, this is nothing new that we invented here uh, since, since 30 years ago, or that the DAD has invented. This has always been there, and this is the crucial point for research to exchange uh, with other ideas. Okay, next uh, I would like to ask uh, Shalan Srinivas from the Foundation, uh, the Red Lab Award Foundation from uh, Sweden, from uh, Stockholm. Dr. Blumberg, distinguished Red Lab laureates and my dear friends. Two years ago, this lovely city had its first encounter uh, with the laureates of the Right Livelihood Award. And since then, a city known for its promotion of international cooperation has warmly embraced these 145 inspiring individuals and organizations working for a better tomorrow. Now, at that conference in 2010, one of our laureates, Pat Mooney, uh, who's one of the experts on promoting biodiversity, he said that the diversity of our Right Livelihood Laureates is our strength. And he also predicted that 2012, this year, would be a very important year. After all, it was going to be the 40th anniversary of the Stockholm Conference that launched intergovernmental work on the environment, so Stockholm plus 40. It was also the 20th conference of uh, the uh, 20th anniversary of the Rio Conference that was the Earth Summit, which was again very landmark. And Civil society has, through these conferences, played a key role in pushing the interests of the people, and they've pushed for change. But though they've achieved some major victories, there's still so much to be done, as we all know, and so little time to do, do it. These challenges, which are addressed by some of the laureates we have in the room, include making essential medicine and healthcare a right for all and not just a privilege for some. Uh, they include fighting for environmental justice and it includes also, of course, education and spreading awareness uh, amongst consumers about their rights and responsibilities and knowing whether the products and services they use are produced in a sustainable and fair manner. But these challenges are not insurmountable. The solutions are out there and embodied in our laureates and embodied even this week in Anwar Fazal of Malaysia, in Nemo Basse of Nigeria, and in Dr. Zafrullah Chaudhary of Bangladesh. The energy is also out there. I mean, look at all of you. It's not for nothing that Time magazine said 2011 is the year of the protester. You have Occupy Wall Street, you have the Arab Springs, and you have movements for change everywhere, in India against corruption, in Malaysia for electoral reform. So social movements are everywhere, and they're flowering at a very fast pace. They needed to bring solutions that might exist right now in the periphery and make them the new mainstream. And it is that sort of recognition that we hope that the right livelihood can take these solutions from the periphery and make them the mainstream. And that's what we hope the award does and is doing and continues to do that. But it's not just about us at the foundation or the award, it's also because of our partners that, are, that we are able to do a lot more. In this way, the Right Livelihood College, uh, the Center for Development Research, and the German Academic Exchange Service, or in the DAD, in their own way, are doing a great job in pushing these solutions forward in their own different ways. 
because now we are able to reach more people. It's not just a ceremony in Stockholm. It's a lot more than that. It's a lot more continuous engagement and reaching more people. So far, we've had, I think, even in Bonn, nearly a dozen laureates have come and interacted each time with maybe 20 postdoctoral students. So if you look at the people RLC at Bonn has touched in the last two years, you might have around 100 people, and they go back to their universities and... I think we are building a network here, which a network for change. And let's talk about this workshop. I think we have about 20 students from 15 countries with all working on very timely topics, ranging from pathways to peace in southern Thailand to natural resource governance in Colombia's Pacific coast. I know that each of you students uh, will be inspired by the laureates this week, and I know the interactions you have might spark some ideas in your minds on how to effectively create and energize a social movement based on your research. And I think you'll realize that there are so many links between the research you do and the movements that these laureates are working on. And this it is to harness these synergies um, within the next generation of change makers at the Right Livelihood College was created and it will continue to strive to promote this and that's what makes this workshop so important. Now at the 30th anniversary conference, the laureates made a call, call to change course and reclaim our future. That was the, the theme uh, of that conference. And on, a, on behalf of the executive director of the foundation who unfortunately couldn't be here and the entire Right Level Award family. I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the Center of Development Research, especially Professor Solveig Gerke and Dr. Til Stelmaha for their tireless efforts um, over the last two years to make all this possible. And I also want to express from the Foundation's view the sincere thanks to the DAD for supporting this great work. Thank you for your steadfast and continued support. And finally, I want to also thank the laureates for taking out the time from their busy schedules. I mean, they are all in movements, but they've come here for these few days uh, to invest on the next generation. And someone told me recently that in an era of failing banks and financial crisis, the next generation is really the only safe investment. <laughs> Very good. I want to close with the words of our late laureate, Vangari Matai, who passed away last year, uh, to inspire us as we start this journey this week. And she said, and I quote, Despite all the constraints you might face, the lack of good things that many of us look for, dedicating oneself to the common go good of society, to the environment, to democratic principles, and to peace, is in, of, in and of itself a great reward. Sometimes it is not recognized, sometimes it's not pleasant, but there is a personal satisfaction, a feeling that you've lived your life to the full and that you have been a productive and useful member of the greater community of the living. It is your future. Take it, work for it, devote your life to it, so that you too might pass a better world to your children. And with that, I welcome you all to the workshop, Let Us Get Inspired, walk the talk, and achieve the impossible together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sharan, for uh, your warm words. And we always appreciate uh, the, 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 the help and the work together, the cooperation with the Foundation in, in Stockholm. And uh, you mentioned the diversity in ex uh, of expertise and inexpertise of the laureates. And I also mentioned the, the sheer number of the laureates. It's now, nowadays more than 140, and each year, of course, new laureates with new ideas, with new networks, with new expertise uh, will, will, will come. So it's a, it's a process. Um, and uh, so imagine if you would uh, like to create a consultancy company uh, with this kinds of expertise, with 140 experts from all over the world working since 30 or 40 years on uh, one topic. Imagine uh, what kind of startup capital this would need. So therefore, I think we, as our LLC here at SEF, have the opportunity to use the laureates as resources 
as, as very valuable resources also to transmit knowledge, expertise, and understanding uh, from one generation to another generation. And think about it. Um, yes, you also mentioned that, I mean, all laureates got the award because they are uh, very actively engaging in particular topics. That means that their schedule uh, since 30, 40 years is, is, is very, very busy. I mean, therefore, we are particularly happy uh, to have more than one, even three laureates uh, here at the workshop for one week, imagine. So they dedicate their time uh, until Sunday uh, for us, for you, for the Center for Development Research uh, to work together in this workshop. So, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Helmut Lumba uh, of the uh, DART, the Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst, to give his speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of DART, <laughs> I would like to give a warm welcome to all of you, to our laureates, and to especially, and of course, to the colleagues from the Wright Leifold College and the Center for Development Research. And of course to you, the students, the PhD students, uh, who are here to have the chance to meet uh, the colleagues and the laureates. Um, it's an interesting, uh, uh, interesting talks we had so far. I was actually learning a lot, especially the fact that the Britons and us were fighting side by side at one point in history. <laughs> that was new to me. Uh, very nice, and that there is Minden in Malaysia. But uh, coming back to the purpose of this workshop, I thought that uh, I should not just say welcome, but I should maybe try to make a few remarks on why uh, DART is supporting this uh, uh, Right Life at College uh, idea and the, the, the workshops uh, here in Bonn every year and also the PhD student every year who is uh, sort of attached to one of the laureates and works along these lines. Um, you, you, you know that we are only some 16 days from the, uh, from the uh, United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development Rio Plus 20, which will take place um, where? Where will it be? New York. Huh? Yes. And um, thousands of people will participate, uh, government leaders uh, and their advisors, of course, NGOs, uh, scientists, um, to discuss how we can reduce poverty, how can, how can we advance social equity, how can we ensure environmental protection on a planet which is getting more and more crowded. Whatever the outcome of this conference may be, some people will be very disappointed, others may be or feel encouraged. The, the whole preparation process, these numerous international conferences, hearings, research, uh, um, which has been done, made it very clear that we are heading towards a unprecedented, unprecedented sort of crisis. Um, we have uh, development paradigms and economic patterns which lead us to environmental and economic problems of uh, dimension which we did not have so far. And we all are to, or have to be aware that facing these challenges, challenges change is sort of inescapable. Even those who would like to, everything as it is, they will not be able to do so. We in, um, at, at DART <laughs> believe that education and especially higher education is one of the most important and powerful drivers of change. It can gain significant relevance in promoting equitable and sustainable world development. Strong universities can strengthen a country's cap capability to solve own problems and to solve them in its own way. Um, at the same time, strong and independent universities serve as catalysts for change. They generate and distribute capacities, knowledge necessary for social and political transformation. We also are convinced that international cooperation is very much needed to address pressing global issues. The problems are global we have to work together on a global scale to solve them. This is why we have made university cooperation 
and especially cooperation between us here in Germany, our universities here, and universities in developing countries, to one of our core areas of activity. Within the broad range of our programs and projects, you may have got to know some of them already, I think that the Wright Livelihood College and its campus here in Bonn can make a very special contribution. With the help of the laureates of the Wright Livelihood Award, it can show us how to bridge the gap between science and civil society. At this point, I would like to share some thoughts with you which I picked up recently at the two DAE supported conferences on research and development, one in South Africa and one here in Bonn. And um, I would like to, um, first of all, draw a quote Neville Alexander, who is a very good friend uh, of DART uh, and others, a very well known political activist and linguist from South Africa. He actually was long-term member of the ANC and also spent many years on the Robben Island, in the Robben Island prison in Cape Town. Um, he draws our attention to the fact that our universities undergo a fundamental transformation which is triggered by what has been called the knowledge economy. And he identifies, and then I quote him, a symbiotic mutually reinforcing relationship between university researchers, especially in science and technology, and transnational corporations that are heavily dependent on the knowledge produced in relevant research centers. In order to maintain international competitiveness, these corporations push for governments to design national systems of innovation. This system, as he describes it and as the knowledge economy demands it from us, may provide technical innovation, no doubt. But it also widens the gap between the networks and markets of the knowledge economy or of the knowledge society and the millions across the globe who remain disconnected and whose needs and aspirations are not reflected in this type of knowledge production. However, as Neville Alexander puts it, and I quote again, civil society, or more precisely, the disempowered mass of the people, in some sense is one of the main constituencies to which any university, especially in the South, has to be accountable. And in order to be accountable, we need more research into socio-economic and cultural aspects of change, we need the humanities, which are at times downsized and marginalized in this new system of knowledge economy, and we need the cooperation of universities with the civil society. This is from my perspective exactly what the Right Life Lead College stands for. My other friend who I like, would like to quote is Elisio Macamo, a sociologist and a, a DART alumnus from Mozambique. And he told us in a recent meeting that development-related research should not focus on practical solutions for problems, but on the problems to which solutions are needed. I quote him, but I translated it into English, now it's not his, his English, but I tried to. The world, especially Africa, is drowning in a sea of solutions, which well-intended people hold ready since decades. In other words, in Africa, solutions are not always the solution, but rather the problem. <laughs> Ready-made practical solutions, mostly from the North, prevent a real dialogue of researchers and prevent them from asking the right questions. And the right questions, according to uh, Dr. Makamo, are for his environment, uh, for Africa, why don't Africans find their own solutions? Why are Northern researchers so concerned about African practical problems? Do they have the historical and cultural knowledge to assess the consequences of their solutions? And to really embark on a dialogue in answering these research questions, Makamo suggests a new type of North-South research partnership 
in which the agenda and the funding guidelines are not being set by the Northern partners alone. Even in this regard, in asking the right question, the right research questions, and empowering communities to develop their own appropriate practical solutions, I see the Right Livelihood College as a pilot project from which all of us can hopefully learn a lot. The Right Livelihood College and this workshop in particular offers a unique opportunity to link ambitious multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary research to real life problems. It encourages the development of innovative approaches. Knowledge transfer here does not begin only once research results are published and instead researchers and practitioners work together in the formulation of research questions and even in their research activities. Research outputs alone do not amount to knowledge adopted by society. Interaction with and involvement of the civil society is key to the relevance of research partnerships. It is a, an honor and a pleasure to contribute to this outstanding initiative by supporting this workshop. I will support it next year and the year after. Uh, and by also uh, sort of devoting one PhD grant every year for research related to right livelihood topics. And um, we think that for you, the students, the working together with the award holders, award laureates, offers a unique opportunity for students and researchers, not only to gain new knowledge, but also to reconsider theories, models, and assumptions in the light of developments in the field. So I may call the Right Livelihood College a future lab for research and impact on real-world problems. As Andra Fassal put it, today's problems can only be addressed together and we need the inspiration of success stories. I'm sure you will find this inspiration here. And I would like to thank once again everybody who's sort of catering for these inspirations and make this uh, workshop possible. Thank you. So, um, you mentioned also two, two very important things that I would like to uh, you know, have a look on. So, uh, one was, I mean, that, that Africa in particular, and I think this is also uh, uh, relevant for, for other Asian or Latin American countries, is drowning in a, a sea in a flood of uh, so-called solutions, maybe. And we've had this not only since recently, but since many, many decades. Um, so I think uh, here we can offer a, a platform in this uh, workshop where many of you and the laureates uh, who have been working in NGOs, and this of course also includes the US of PhD student, because I mean you are here also, not only but also because you have a long uh, track uh, working in NGOs in your own countries. So. Normally, you do not just jump from university to PhD. So, uh, therefore, and I think this expertise, working for several years in an NGO uh, uh, on a particular problem, um, helped you to create your research questions. And therefore, all of you, we have 20 PhDs here, even more, uh, with, of course, research questions. The first thing when you start a PhD, I mean, is the research question. So this is the interesting thing that in the coming week we will talk about. Which are the questions? Are they relevant? When are they relevant? How could they be more relevant? So what are the methods or approaches to, to tackle with these uh, questions? So asking the right questions uh, you know, is, of course, very important for a PhD. But as you are uh, working in NGOs and uh, civil society organizations, uh, you are a bit advanced asking the right questions, maybe. So, um, the other one is uh, the, the north-south exchange uh, dimension of the whole uh, idea, of the whole campus here. And of course, we also would like to contribute to the north-south exchange and to strengthen and promote this north-south exchange. But I think we can think a little bit further to exchange the south-south-south-north 
exchange. As we have people here from uh, Latin America, from Africa and Asia meeting here together, it's not about only uh, you know, meeting in, in, in Europe, in, in Germany and discussing here and then each individual goes back to his own country. So it's, the idea is to also to create a soft, soft networks and exchange and interaction, mutual learning. So, having said that, um, time is up. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, talks. And so thereafter, we'll have a small uh, kind of reception and coffee outside. Of course, you are all invited. And in the coming week, as you have seen in the, in the, the ten, 10 pages of program, we'll have so many discuss, uh, discussions, interesting talks. We'll have group work. We'll have public panels uh, in the University Club here in Bonn. We'll have uh, uh, talks. we have a photo exhibition even on the work of the laureates. Uh, we'll have a theater play on uh, uh, Thursday. We're really particularly happy to have um, uh, people, the theater play people from Freiburg here. Um, so you see already we'll, we'll have a very, very busy week. And I think and I know you're all prepared for this busy week. But first, let's have uh, a small reception, some uh, coffee together. But uh, please, uh, let us make a photograph, a group photo, before we uh, rush into the, the coffee and the, the discussions outside. So maybe first, we'll have a group photo and then the coffee and the discussions. Thank you very much for coming.